Hello everybody! In this video we are flying to Denver, Colorado and from there we are going to explore the Four Corners region of the United States, also more colloquially known as the Wild West. We are going to do this journey on a rental Class C motorhome, so let's check it out. So this is the RV we have rented. It's actually bigger than I expected. Although I would have preferred a smaller rig, uh, this 28-footer has a nice bedroom in the back with a queen bed and a pretty decent storage, a separate shower for which I would rather have a sliding door instead of a curtain, but whatever. A separate bathroom with a sink and a toilet and overall pretty spacious. Let's see the outside. So here's the outside of the RV. So as you can see overall, it's a pretty good rig. I would have preferred uh, something smaller, as I said, a 23 or a 25 footer, but it drives great, so let's get on the road. In order to reach uh, this stunningly beautiful area of the country, we must cross the mighty Rocky Mountains. As we advance uh, west, the landscape becomes increasingly rugged and beautiful. The highest peaks covered in perpetual snow. Well, we continue on our journey west, slowly climbing the Rocky Mountains. Uh, pretty soon we'll reach the continental divide. And then down we go. Before 1973, you had to climb all the way up to the Loveland Pass to go across the Continental Divide, but not anymore. Nowadays, we can take the Eisenhower Tunnel, opened in 1973 and fully completed in 1979, and it's a much faster route. At over 11,000 feet, it is the highest point in the US interstate highway system. We might take the scenic route uh, over the Continental Divide on the way back. We make a quick stop by Lake Dillon to stretch our legs and admire this beautiful scenery. A few miles further to the west, we pass by the skiing resort town of Vail. Established in the 1960s, it is the third largest ski mountain in North America. We also pass by Avon. As we continue, the terrain becomes increasingly arid, perhaps a preview of what's to come, a sign that we're getting closer to the sandstone landscape of the high desert of the Colorado Plateau, which we'll visit later in our trip. This part of the highway, along with the Eisenhower Tunnel and the Vail Pass, are considered engineering marvels of the interstate highway system. We also passed by the picturesque Glenwood Springs, home to the Colorado Mountain College, and named the most fun town in America by Rand McNally back in 2011. We must revisit this nice town on the way back, but right now I want to check out the canyon one more time. I'll be honest with you, one of the cameras malfunctioned and I went to get some footage of uh, Glenwood Canyon and the swelling Colorado River, just in case I don't return this way. So let's make a left and take I-70 back east towards Denver, if only for a few miles.
Let's get out of this uh, rest area. Apparently, this is called the Glenwood Canyon Resort. Let's check out the swelling Colorado River. Actually, the whole area is under a flood watch. To think this is the same stream that will later form Lake Powell, the same water that carved the Grand Canyon and powers Hoover Dam and, and created the environmental disaster that is the Salton Sea. To think it is reduced to a trickle by the time it reaches the Gulf of California. We stop one last time to check out the river and west we go. In the original plan I was going to drive all the way to Utah today and then some, but as you will soon find out, sometimes I make overly ambitious plans and this one is one of those times. It turns I'm tired, it is getting late, so we decide to change the plan and spend the night at the beautiful Island Acres campground part of the James M. Rubb Colorado River State Park. We are just a few miles away from Grand Junction. We finally arrive at the campground. We park at our designated site and first things first, let's hook up the RV. I decided to do the sewer first, but now that I think about it, I probably should have done that last, it being the dirtiest part of the operation. Then I proceed to hook up the city water connection, pretty straightforward. And finally, the electric power. Looks good. Hi. And uh, the three prongs match this, so. Here goes nothing. We should have power. And that was it. Our demonstration of the connections. Well, looks like we are fully hooked. So let's relax and enjoy the sunset. Hello everybody, we have driven uh, all the way from Denver, Colorado uh, to hear this uh, campground at the James M. Rubb Colorado State Park. I have to read it because it's a mouthful. But it's a very nice look. Look at the, look at the scenery. Look at the scenery all around us. The look, that's the RV back there. And um, it's very nice. Uh, tomorrow we, go, we will continue towards uh, Moab. Where I made fire. I like this place. We should stay here longer. Yeah, very nice indeed. Good morning, coming to you from the Island Acres Campground in Western Colorado. By the way, this is the view from our bedroom. Nice, huh? In the morning, we walk around the campground, wishing we had more time to explore. But we are already two hours behind schedule, and Utah awaits. Time to go. We are on the road again.
An hour later, we are greeted by this colorful sign. We have arrived at the state of Utah. And we are taking the isolated state route 128 with no services for 54 miles. It is called the Upper Colorado River Scenic Byway. Not very scenic yet, in fact, it's pretty desolate. We even passed by the ghost town of Cisco, a former typical Old West Railroad town. We are crossing this desert. To the left, uh, we see the La Salle Mountains in the distance, getting a glimpse of Fisher Tower, which uh, we'll see up close in a few. As we continue, the terrain becomes increasingly rugged. We join the north bank of the Colorado River, Right before crossing the river, if you look to the left of the screen, we'll get a glimpse of the Dewey Bridge, accidentally burned in 2008. And until then, it was the longest suspension bridge in Utah. Very sad, it got burned allegedly by a child playing with matches. Actually, I'd like to thank one of my viewers for recommending this route, because I might have missed it otherwise. This scenery on our way to Arches National Park is truly breathtaking. Here we stop a few minutes by the river to admire this view of the Fisher Towers and the mountains in the distance. Let's continue driving through the gorge. We are approaching Castle Valley. We see Castleton Tower in the distance. This place is slightly reminiscent of uh, Monument Valley, uh, where we're going the day after tomorrow. And like Monument Valley, it has been used as the location for many classic Western movies, uh, such as uh, Wagon Master, Rio Grande. It was around here that I originally intended to spend the night uh, boondocking. It is called boondocking when you stay without hookups. Actually, it was going to be through this dirt road. This is all BLM land. BLM stands for Bureau of Land Management, uh, so you are allowed to camp for the night at certain places. The dirt road is a little too rough for the RV, so we go back to State Route 128. Besides, we are already a few hours behind schedule. Stop one more time to take a few pictures. I just can't help myself. Let's continue. A couple of miles down the road, we reach a US 191 and we turn right, north towards Arches National Park. As you can see, there is already a pretty long line to go into the park. As soon as we enter, we are greeted by all these unique rock formations. We stop at this viewpoint to admire the beauty of this place and to see this view of the Moab Fault from above. We continue going deeper into the park, and everywhere you look, you see something worth pointing the camera at. We stop by the La Salle Mountains viewpoint, but really, who cares about the La Salle Mountains at this point? Take a look at this place, this valley. In front of us, at the rock formation called the Oregon. To the left, the Three Gossips, part of this collection of sandstone columns called the Courthouse Towers. We continue driving along the scenic drive, and although we would like to stop at every single viewpoint, we have one main attraction in mind, 
towards the far side of the park, towards the east. Uh, this is one of those places where the camera just doesn't do it justice. It is impossible to capture the grandeur, the magnificence of uh, these massive rock formations. We pass uh, by the petrified dunes and uh, the Great Wall. and the window arches. Of course, uh, we must make a quick stop by the Balanced Rock, one of the most well-known formations of this park. It looks like it is about to tip over, but trust me, it's been there for a long time. We continue and eventually make a right. This is the main attraction of the park, so the parking lot is not surprisingly very crowded. Is there one here or is there a car there? We are the luckiest motherfuckers on earth. <laughs> <laughs> ah! So lucky to find that spot. It was meant to be. We are hiking to the delicate arch. Yes, we out of shape indoor flatlanders are about to embark in this great adventure. First, uh, we pass by the remains of the Wolf Ranch, built in 1888 by a Civil War veteran, John Wesley Wolf. We will stop again on the way back to see it, as well as some Ute petroglyphs that are nearby. The whole hike is a little over three miles round trip, and the sign said moderate to strenuous, and let me tell you, it is really hot. We chose the worst possible time of the day, noon. We're almost having second thoughts, uh, but we are prepared. We have plenty of water and are in good spirits. We have to go all the way up there. This first half mile is not so bad. The terrain can be a little irregular, but there's not too much elevation gained or lost. Here comes the hard part, the Slick Rock Slab. It is said to be very slippery in the winter and during rainy season, but today is not too bad. This is perhaps the most strenuous part of this hike. A little more than halfway there. We'll make it. We see the La Salle Mountains on the way up. The steep trail is marked by these stacks of rocks uh, called cairns. We continue. The next part of the trail is more rocks and sand and no shade. Rocks and sand. Hard surface. Where's Adam? I don't know where Adam is. Eventually we reach this section along this ledge with this wall to the right and the desert to our left. A little scary but the trail is uh, wide enough so as long as we play it safe uh, I think we'll be alright. As we pass the frame arch we know we are almost there. This is not it. And here it is, Delicate Arch, pretty much the symbol of Utah, its most famous rock formation. It was definitely worth the hike. At last, we have arrived at the Delicate Arch. And here it is, in that wonderful, beautiful place. I lay down under the arch for a few seconds to cherish the moment, if you will. Okay, it's time to head back. Okay, let's head back down. But uh, let's stop by the window arch first. And here I am. Here I am. 
here I am at the double arch. This is another great view. I have no idea how I'm gonna get back down there. Beautiful. We'll see. The good thing about the return trip is that we are going mostly downhill. Down and then we go. Okay, let's check out the petroglyphs now. These are historic Ute images, depicting men on horseback, which were introduced by the Spanish. We cross the creek and once again we see the Wolf Ranch. We can even see inside the ranch. Not a whole lot to see though. Let's get back in the RV. We continue along the scenic drive towards this area called the Fiery Furnace, a natural labyrinth of uh, narrow passages between sandstone walls and a very difficult hike. We continue driving west. On the right, we'll see the Skyline Arch. We are approaching this area called the Devil's Garden, with more trails and natural arches. They even have a campground, so we know where we're going to stay the next time we come this way. The area is pretty congested, same as uh, the Delicate Arch, and the campground is full, of course. And honestly, I don't have the stamina nor the time to do another serious hike today. I do get off the RV, check out the crows, and what the heck, let's walk a little bit on this uh, Devil's Garden Trail. The whole trail is 7.2 miles, way too long to start right now. But it is only 0.8 miles to the Landscape Arch and uh, 2 miles to the Double O Arch, uh, so I'm torn between my desire to see these arches and my own exhaustion. And although I know I'm going to regret it, I decide to go back. Off we go, reluctantly saying goodbye to Arches National Park. We stop for a few minutes by the Fiery Furnace Trailhead. This hike is so strenuous and dangerous that a hiking permit is required and they even recommend that you take a guided tour on your first time. That's it, we're getting out of the park. The courthouse towers bidding us farewell. I stop one last time by the Park Avenue trailhead and off to Moab we go. The small city of Moab caters to all the tourists, hikers, off-roaders, rafters, bikers, rock climbers, and all the people who come to visit the two major national parks of the area. Arches, where we just were, and Canyonlands, which we will visit someday, some other time. We buy supplies at the KOA campground, fill up the tank, and off we go towards Cortez. Mm -hmm. 
We encountered this arch on the side of the road and naturally we stopped for the photo op. A little over two hours later, we arrive at the Sundance RV Resort in Cortez, Colorado. We end the day at this Mexican restaurant called El Burro Pancho. The food is great, the margaritas are perfect, and it feels overall authentic. Good morning. Nothing like a shot of Cuban coffee to start your day. Yep, I'm awake now. Today we are visiting Mesa Verde National Park, near Cortez, Colorado. This area was uh, home to the ancestral Pueblo people for about 700 years, and then in the late 1200s, for reasons that are not entirely clear, they all moved away. The brand new visitor center opened in 2012, and it has all these displays uh, depicting how archaeologists uh, think the ancestral Pueblo people lived uh, daily life, the tools they used how they made their pottery, and how they built their different types of dwellings. Let's go into the park. Oh, by the way, one very important thing to keep in mind is that in order to visit the main sites, such as the Cliff Palace, the Balcony House, the Long House, you must purchase the tickets beforehand at the visitor center. It would really suck to drive all the way into the park and not be able to see at least one of these sites. We have a pretty long uphill drive here uh, to the Mesa's top at 8,500 feet. Fantastic panoramic views of the Mancos and Montezuma valleys. We stop here briefly at the Montezuma Valley Overlook. Very nice views of the valley, and it's also where the old uh, knife edge road used to go through. Sometimes I leave the camera on inadvertently and get these nice time lapses. Further along, uh, we have a fortuitous encounter with a baby black bear, and leave it up to me to show up with a big RV and scare him away. Sorry to spoil the show, folks. And another great view of the valley. The camera just doesn't do it justice. And another pretty time-lapse. You gotta love the clouds. We reach the top of the mesa and stop by a primitive pit house. One of the many in the area. Because of their partial underground construction with a roof, they were warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And typically had a small antechamber and a larger main chamber. Our next stop is the Navajo Canyon Overlook, where we get this uh, pretty good view of the canyon. As the weather begins to deteriorate, we stop by the Sun Temple. From here we can see the Cliff Palace, which we will visit next. In our excitement, we forget to see the actual Sun Temple. Maybe we'll have time later. Let's visit the Cliff Palace. First, uh, we go down these abrupt stairs with these great views of the canyon and another dwelling on the other side. Here we are, waiting for the guide. We go up this ladder, right next to the structure. We are treated to this very thorough exposition by this very enthusiastic and knowledgeable ranger. We learn about their water source, which apparently seeped through the rocks from snow melt above. A seep spring. Pretty much, if you think about it, it's a leaky faucet. Possibly four generations just putting this together. And it seems that it goes up in four cycles. The first is right here. And we find they're probably building in the left hand corner first because this is going to capture the most winter sun. And you've got a nice source of easy, free heat. But then the community gets bigger, might have gotten more popular. 
And over time, room by room, they add on. As the family expands, the city expands. Archaeologists think that some, most of these structures, especially in the middle, probably went up to three stories. If not anymore, you had storage in the upper attic there. Only thing we don't find are Christmas ornaments. But some places we did find a couple pots, blankets, tools left up there. Not too much though. And then down below all the square structures you have your living rooms, your family rooms, storage and bedrooms. And they had trails very similar to what we came down, just not very deep steps like that. They're very shallow, dug into the rock just enough to get you toe purchase, but they're hidden for the most part. You may have to know where it is, got to know what to look for. We will see an original trail as we make our way out. That is an original exit and entrance the way we're going to leave today. Maybe a rope system, mm -hmm. bringing the pots of water up, down, maybe just bringing all the materials that you need down into the site. Probably some industrial accidents here and there. Because mm -hmm. all the rope was made out of the yucca plant. Over at Step House, we found 1,300 feet double ply yucca fiber rope. Continuous. Continuous wow. strand. Wow. Coiled up in a basket. Somebody had nothing else better to do. <laughs> or that was that main person's main job. We don't know too much about society when we're looking at these structures. All we find are pots and utility tools. That's it. No writing. Very little pictographs or petroglyphs, just a ghost town sitting inside the cliff. So some think maybe the smaller dwellings up top in the cliffs, they might have been your potters, your weavers, your rope makers, your sandals. The one that we see across, you see one mm -hmm. from right up right above, right. across, just kind of all by itself. All by itself. And that's how most of them are. About every 500 feet, usually down the canyon, there's some dwelling some structure inside either just hanging off on one of the shelves that's maybe two feet wide or they've got a nice little alcove right there and this was the center possibly so when we think about putting this together you want to take it apart block by block and if you want as we make our way down to the middle in just a minute here i'm going to leave this here pick this up see what a small block feels like and just imagine coming down the trail or roping this down two, three, five of these pieces, amassing the materials to put your home together. This was uh, perhaps the aqueduct, fascinating the ingenuity of these ancient dwellers. What we find is that these people had to start relearning how to build inside the alcove. For a good 200 years at least, they're building stone pueblos up on top. They know how to work on a flat surface, building up from there. But if you look at all these boulders hanging out around us, you've got to work around that. They're using the original material left. So if you look at this bottom wall here, that is very sad compared to this. And I do have to put a disclaimer on that. That is partial park service reconstruction. But it looks like from the original foundation that we found, they're using all those angular pieces, just getting it up in a hurry so they can start building it. And then the master masons show up. The walls are almost perfectly smooth, or they were at one time originally. But there's a problem. Anybody pick up that small block up over there? Is that light? It's not. And this mortar is just a basic sand, clay, water mixture. You put that down, let it set up. If your block is too heavy, it might make that ooze out all over the place. So they figure out a tool. It's all these little tiny stones that either they're chipping away or they're the remnants of all these carvings. And they start pressing them into the mortar from both sides of the wall, forcing that mortar into the middle, once the chinking stones reach the outside, they're flush with the wall, they then patch those gaps with more mortar to smooth it out and to finish. So you have stabilization with recycled material. 
And in some places with original walls, you can still see fingerprints where they pushed that mortar in and smoothed it out so many years ago. You get high enough, you need to add a roof, you need to add a floor. They made their roof supports with wood from juniper trees. But the one thing we ask, where are they finding straight juniper? Apparently, there are not enough straight juniper trees in this area to build uh, the many rooms in this dwelling. Here we can see the other smaller dwelling on the other side of the canyon. And uh, our only chance to see the Cliff Palace without any tourists in it. A little further along, we learn about these rooms called the Kivas. The ingenuity involved in their construction is amazing. Kiva means literally underground in the Hopi language. And they start building the roof halfway inside this room. Hexagonal ring after hexagonal ring, each one getting smaller and smaller as it made its way higher and higher. Eventually, once it got about right where I'm standing here, there would be a square hole directly in the center of the roof. All three of these kivas that we just walked by, this is one large open courtyard. And what we know for this size kiva here in the park, especially in the cliff homes, this is a family room. This is where they're probably sleeping in the winter. It's going to be the warmest place. You find anchor points in the floor where they're doing weaving, and they're tying their looms off to the ceiling. Probably the classroom for the children. Uh, the parents are up farming. Grandparents might take the little ones in, tell them the stories, the histories. And at certain times of the year, it's also going to be a ceremonial site as well. This is a prayer room where they contact their ancestors to bring the rain, which almost hit us today, to call for healing, to keep the family alive. This was the center of the family. Each one represents at least one family group. But when we think about the functionality of this room, you've got a fire pit in the middle, you've got a chimney, you need one more thing. You need a lot of air going into that room to keep the fire alive and to push the smoke up and out. So what we find is that the vent shaft starts just to be on that little wall there on the planking, goes straight down to that little door. That's the fresh air intake, pulling that air in. So they realized you get too much of a draft, you're gonna blow your fire out, you're gonna blow ash all over the inside of the room. So they build that wall to deflect the air around the fire, push the smoke up and out, and reflect the heat back into the room. And just that little simple unit right there is ancient technology for these people. The pit houses, the 400s, are built almost identically, just not as deep. And the round tower, right in the middle. The round tower, besides being an observation tower to spy on the neighbors across, was apparently also their observatory. The window would frame solstices and equinoxes, and so they knew when to plant and harvest. It was uh, their clock tower, if you will. It is incredible to think that we had no idea this civilization existed until 1888, when these uh, ruins were discovered by ranchers. That was uh, one great tour, wasn't it? Let me tell you, I have nothing but praise for the National Park Service. I have not met one person who wasn't pleasant, helpful or extremely passionate about their job. Before traveling further west, we stop one last time by the Fire Lookout, the highest point in the park, at 8,572 feet above sea level. From the park point overlook, we get to see these spectacular panoramic views of the Montezuma Valley. We can even see the town of Cortez in the distance. That's it. We are leaving the park for good, with beautiful views as we descend from the Mesa. We pass by the Ute Mountain Indian Reservation. And yes, they do have a casino. The Chimney Rock to our left. 
turn to the west, immersing ourselves into one of the most remote areas of North America. It is our intent to reach the epicenter of the Four Corners region, the very spot where the borders of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico intersect. Two hours later, we arrive at the Four Corners Monument. Here I am at the Four Corners Monument. That's Utah back there. And here I'm walking and now I'm in Colorado. It's from weed. Now I'm in New Mexico. And now I am in Arizona. One hour earlier. Recent surveys have determined that the monument is actually 1,807 feet east of the actual Four Corners point. Still, pretty accurate considering the instruments available at the turn of the 20th century, when they originally surveyed the area. I do have one complaint. The grounds are not very well maintained. You would think that with the $15 the Navajo people charge you to visit the monument and the revenue from all the souvenir sales, they could afford a paved parking lot. Just saying. Onward we go. I, of course, uh, take a photo with uh, the nearby signs for New Mexico and Colorado, and let's include Arizona and Utah as well. Nice, huh? This is the only time in our trip where we actually step on New Mexico soil. We continue riding into the sunset, now going deep into the Navajo Nation, which is a huge area encompassing northeastern Arizona, parts of New Mexico and Utah. After a little over an hour or so, we start seeing the formations of the Valley of the Gods in the horizon. Let me tell you, I would love to do some exploring around this area. The Valley of the Gods uh, is like a smaller version of Monument Valley, if you will, uh, where we're going tomorrow, by the way. But unlike Monument Valley, it's not part of the Navajo Nation. It belongs to the Bureau of Land Management, which means you can camp in the area and have more freedom to roam around. As night falls, we arrive at the place where we are going to spend the night boondocking, dry camping, you know, self-contained, off the grid. We have decided to spend the night at the Goosenecks State Park in Utah, with this beautiful view overlooking a deep meander of the San Juan River. From here we can see the Alhambra Rock and the Monument Valley in the distance. This place has very little light pollution, being so remote and all. And after the moon sets, stars we've never seen before reveal themselves. And I get to see the Milky Way for the first time in my life. I even get to experiment with some long exposure photography. Good morning from Gusnecks State Park. get on the way again, passing near the Valley of the Gods. A little further down we encounter this singular rock formation called the Mexican Hat. See the resemblance? There's a tiny village with uh, this view of the Alhambra rock and some lodges and the gas station. And finally, it reveals itself on the horizon, the place we've been coming to see, Monument Valley. This uh, specific spot is particularly famous for the movie Forest Camp. And this is the very spot where Forest Camp decided he was uh, tired of running. I'm tired of running too. Going back, going back to the RB. <sighs> Here we are, the price of admission $20. The three hour tour is $85 and there's also a two hour tour for 75. 
We park at the oversized vehicle area and it looks like our ride is already waiting for us. The road around the valley is a not very well maintained uh, dirt road, so I apologize in advance for the shaky camera, especially if you're prone to motion sickness. It is definitely a bumpy ride. Fortunately, we get to stop at uh, some of these viewpoints. Here we see the Merrick Butte and the East and West Meetings. What an exceptionally beautiful place this is. We continue bouncing up and down. We stop once again in order to give our butts a rest and to see the Mitchell, Mesa and this uh, pinnacles called the Three Sisters. We also see the Elephant Butte and the Camel Butte on the way. This formation is called the Thumb. We stop once again by the north window, framed by Elephant Butte and Clyde Butte. We can see the bear and rabbit spires in the distance. There are several movies that I want to recommend to you which feature Monument Valley prominently. Here we see this formation called the Rooster and uh, the Three Healers and the famous Totem Pole. One of the movies I was talking about is The Eiger Sanction by Clint Eastwood from 1975, in which they were allowed to climb the Totem Pole with the condition that they would remove all the pythons left by previous climbers. No one has ever been allowed to climb ever since because uh, the Totem Pole is considered sacred by the Navajo people, thus making Clint Eastwood the last person ever to climb the spire. We stop for a few minutes uh, by the site of these 2,000-year-old uh, petroglyphs. This is also the site of the Eye of the Sun Arch. We also pass by the Big Hogan as part of the extended tour. This is very nice. ear of the wind. And here I get to climb the San Jun to the ear of the wind. We stop once again by the Indian head and the sleeping dragon. You can kind of see the head over there and the long body to the right. We pass by the three sisters once again on our way to the John Ford Point. John Ford directed a great classic, perhaps the movie that put Monument Valley on the map, the one that epitomized it as the look of the Wild West. The movie Stagecoach from 1939. Ford directed many other movies uh, such as The Searchers, a classic Vista Vision masterpiece from 1956. We have a traditional Navajo lunch of sheep camp mutton stew and fried bread with honey at the appropriately named uh, The View Hotel. The food is nothing to write home about, but the panoramic view is priceless. We stop on the way out to take one last photo with Monument Valley in the background. And another photo with the Arizona sign. We begin the long two and a half hour journey towards Page, Arizona, where we will spend the night. Here we see the Owl Rock and the Agathla Peak, perhaps better known by its Spanish name, El Capitan.
The road across this arid area of Arizona seems endless. The welcome site of the Navajo power plant tells us we are almost there. Eventually, we make it to our destination, the Wawip Campground by Lake Powell, part of the Glen Canyon Recreational Area. We park at our designated spot with this partial view of the lake. Very, very nice. In the original plan, tomorrow we would continue towards the north rim of the Grand Canyon, but this place is so nice that we are going to stay an extra night and relax. Good morning from the Wahweb RV Park, part of the Lake Powell Resort, near Page, Arizona. So many attractions nearby. We walk along this path a little over a mile to the main resort where we are going to take a boat tour of the lake. We're going to see Antelope Canyon, the part that is underwater, and the Navajo Canyon. And we depart. The Navajo Power Station ever present. And that's the hotel up there. With this view of Castle Rock to the left, we are going to go around Antelope Island, which, uh, due to the marked fluctuations in water levels, sometimes it is actually a peninsula. Here's the Wawip Marina, with over 500 vessels, worth as a whole many, many millions of dollars. The reason the water level shifts so dramatically, historically, over 100 feet, is because Lake Powell is actually an artificial lake, a reservoir, so the water level depends on the seasonal snow runoff of the Colorado River coming from the mountains. The lake was created by flooding Glen Canyon when they constructed the Glen Canyon Dam. Completed in 1963, it took 11 years for the water level to rise to the high water mark. We continue speeding away on the south side of Antelope Island towards the Antelope Canyon. Isn't that nice, your own little crack on the side of the canyon, in the shade, to take a break? The canyon narrows until the point where we must turn around, back out into the lake, admiring these astounding shapes carved in the sandstone by erosion over the course of thousands of years. And we are back by this narrow stretch of water with Antelope Island to our left. Our next stop is the Navajo Canyon, but first we must pass by the Antelope Point Marina. Look at all these luxurious houseboats. We see the Tower Butte in the distance. Once again, we see the butte lurking behind the sandstone. We finally start approaching Navajo Canyon. Obviously not the same Navajo Canyon we saw back in Mesa Verde National Park. The Navajo Canyon is one of Lake Powell's 96 canyons and is one of the longest ones. Here we see a great example of what is called the Navajo Tapestry. This mix of colors found on the sandstone wall. It almost looks like a mural, but made by nature. Iron oxide and manganese residue from above drapes down the side of the canyon over the course of centuries. And this uh, natural work of art is what we get. We learn the difference between a butte and a mesa. It turns a butte is taller than it is wide, and a mesa, well, wider than it is tall. 
we head back with the Castle Rock ahead of us. Going back through this narrow canal only because this year the water level is high enough, otherwise we would have had to turn around the way we came. And we are back by the Wawip Marina, and this is the end of, of our boat tour. Yeah, I know, I'm kind of obsessed with that butte. What can I say? Time to get on the road again, although we'll be back here at the campground tonight once again to sleep. Right now we're going to visit Lower Antelope Canyon, which is uh, nearby. Not the part we just visited by the lake, but the part above water, which is probably the more famous one. Uh, it is a slot canyon, which is a canyon which is uh, much narrower than it is tall, and it is formed by the wear of water rushing through the rock. The drive uh, from the campground is about 14 miles. And here we are. The entrance is by this uh, dirt road near the Navajo power station. The total price for the one-hour tour is $28 per person, cash only, and that includes a Navajo permit. We follow our young Navajo guide down to the canyon under the scorching sun. We begin our descent into the canyon down these steep stairs. At the bottom, the temperature is uh, much cooler. Thank goodness. The different colors on the rock, we learn, are caused by the way it reflects sunlight at different angles, creating all these surreal effects. All the rock is actually pretty much the same color. Lower Antelope Canyon is open to the public seven days a week. It only closes when rain is in the forecast because of the high risk of flash floods. We have taken one of the two tours available. This one is operated by Kent Tours, Overall, it's a very nice experience. By the way, as I said earlier, this is Lower Antelope Canyon. There is also an Upper Antelope Canyon, which is a little taller with flatter terrain and more accessible, but much more crowded as well, and more expensive. You actually have to book the tour back at Page, Arizona, and they bring you to the entrance of the canyon by Jeep. If you have accessibility issues, that one may be the one for you but we have chosen the lower canyon and we don't regret it one bit. I mean, look at this place. This is surreal. Climbing the stairs of the Antelope Canyon, the lower Antelope Canyon. An hour later, we emerge on the other side. We get back on the road uh, promptly, going towards the Horseshoe Bend. There is this uh, rather challenging trail to get to it, especially for our exhausted and out of shape bodies. But we keep going, anyways. At the end of the trail, there is this horseshoe-shaped meander of the Colorado River, which, by the way, is very well worth the mile-long trail. And here it is, in all its glory. 
Again, one of those places where the 2D camera just doesn't really do it justice. There are numerous photographers by the edge of the cliff capturing this very photogenic place. We start heading back up the trail, uh, looking back one last time for this great look from the distance. Let's return to the RV, shall we? We make one last stop at the Wawip point. From this vantage point we can see this commanding view of the South Lake Powell, the area we visited by boat earlier. Enjoying this beautiful view is a fitting end to a wonderful day. There is the marina, and the resort and campground, and the tour boat, just uh, like the one we took this morning. After our very pleasant stay here at the Wawip Resort near Page, Arizona, we hit the road again. We are driving further west and then north on Highway 89 towards Bryce National Park. A little over two and a half hours in total and I know, please don't send me any nasty emails. How can I take this route and not pass by Zion National Park? It is just a 20 minute detour to the park entrance. Well, I feel Zion deserves a lot more than just a few hours. Besides, we are racing against the clock. We have to return the RV at Denver in less than two days. I'll come back this way some other time, I promise. Even though the drive has uh, some picturesque areas, sometimes it seems endless. We drive uh, through the scenic town of Caneb, often called the Little Hollywood, because of its history as the filming location for so many Western films. Here we take a more northerly route. If we were going to Zion, we would have turned left right here, right before Mount Carmel and Orderville. But as I said before, there's no time, so we keep going. Yep, we killed the bug right at the very spot where the lens of the GoPro is. There's a bunch of German bakeries along the way. We turn right on to State Route 12, and the jagged rock formations are a sign that we are getting very close to Bryce. We have arrived, the fee to enter $25. The canyon is pretty long, so we are just going to check out some of the main viewpoints, beginning with Bryce Point. We park at the crowded lot. And here we are, Bryce Point, elevation 8300 feet above sea level. We start to see these magnificent views of this place that frankly looks like another planet. There are some hiking trails down there, which unfortunately we'll have to do some other time. Check out 
this little fellow. <laughs> Apparently, it is a golden mantled ground squirrel. Isn't this a truly remarkable place? We keep on going. Next, we are going to the inspiration point. And I can see how one can get inspired by all this otherworldly landscape. We get a little bit of rain here and there as we drive to our last viewpoint, the sunset point. It's raining a little bit. Here we get to see Thor's hammer, one of Utah's most famous rocks, standing alone among all the other hoodoos. Yeah, hoodoo, that's how these rock formations are called. There is this hiking trail called the Wall Street that, again, we wish we had the time to take. It is time to leave. We decided to take the road less traveled and we head north on State Route 22 also known as Jones Valley Road. It turns out to be a very, very secondary road. But we didn't come all the way to central Utah to drive on the interstate, did we? We barely encounter a soul except for the occasional herd of cows uh, hanging out, grazing. Hello, Baca. After a while, the terrain becomes a little more rugged along this gorge. We drive by this abandoned structure, the Osiris Creamery. It is all part of the Osiris Ghost Town. And we get a little bit more rain. About 10 miles further north, we encounter the small town of Antimony, which feels like being in a different era. Seriously, it's like being in the 70s. Pretty surreal. Look at this huge tractor and the old truck behind. By Otter Creek State Park, we turn right into State Route 62, another straight, somewhat boring road. Boring, I mean, in the context of what we've seen. Fascinating when compared to, to the Florida Storm Pike, for example. We get a quick break by the junction of State Route 62 with State Route 24 and continue towards Capitol Reef National Park. After the small towns of Loa and Bicknell, we start seeing the first prominent rock formations leading us to Capitol Reef. Here's the chimney rock. We even stop for the photo op. We continue on the road and stop once again by the fluted rock. Next, on the left, we see the castle. We stop briefly to check out these ancient petroglyphs of the Fremont, which were uh, contemporaries of the ancestral Pueblo people. There are many hiking trails around the area, most notably the one to the Cassidy Arch. But today, yeah, you know what I'm gonna say. 
we're just driving through no time We continue towards Goblin Valley, where we are going to spend the night. And we have arrived right before sunset. Our reserved campsite with my name on it, next to all this natural beauty. Here we had a great camping experience. Some young fellows from Provo, I think, that were staying at the campsite next to us saw that we were eating microwaved frozen pizza and shared the leftovers of a delicious stew with us. Very nice. Good night. Good morning from the beautiful Goblin Valley Campground. No, that is not our motor home. Today we are heading back east towards Denver, but first uh, let's explore Goblin Valley, shall we? Oh, by the way, that is our rental Class C motorhome. It is uh, such a beautiful morning right here on the Goblin Valley campground. The morning light really shows off all the colors of all these uh, rock formations. Let's drive uh, to the dump station first so we can do our business. And now, let's check the actual Goblin Valley. There is a trail, but uh, let's just take the car and get there faster. It is a pretty unique place. According to geologists, in the Jurassic era this was at the edge of an inland sea and apparently the tidal sediments of sand, slit and clay became uh, all these uh, sandstone formations which are continually changing by the way, even today. Pretty cool place, huh? Back to the RV. Oh, way up there. And here we see more goblins. Doesn't that look like a Hershey kiss? We go north on State Route 24 and then east on I-70. Once again, we pass near Moab and later into the great state of Colorado. We also pass a Grand Junction with this view of Mount Garfield and the Colorado River State Park. Pretty soon we start seeing the foothills of the Rockies in the distance. See how the landscape slowly starts to change. We are driving along the north bank of the Colorado River uh, towards Glenwood Canyon. Our next stop is uh, Glenwood Springs. We passed by here briefly on the way west and we liked it a lot. It is uh, contained in a valley at the confluence of the Colorado and Roaring Fork Rivers. We are getting hungry, so let's have a nice lunch, uh, some craft beer at the, this place called The Pullman, and we'll be on our way. Not before walking off our lunch along this charming little town.
Time to go. We continue heading east with the Colorado River to our right. We start going into the Glenwood Canyon region. Isn't this a magnificently beautiful area? It is considered an engineering marvel of the United States interstate highway system. I mean, they had some help from the Colorado River, which carved the canyon, but it still is truly amazing. Anyhow, enjoy the ride. At some point, uh, there is an exit uh, to the Hanging Lake Trail, a hike we ought to do some of the time. And we continue driving along I-70. We encounter the skiing resort of Vail once again. We are almost at 10,000 feet, over 3,000 meters above sea level, getting close to some of the highest points in the interstate highway system. But we plan to go even higher. We are stopped here at Shrine Pass, kind of close to the Continental Divide. And um, it's pretty chilly outside, actually. We are going to take the older scenic route, US 6, at the town of Silverthorne. Unlike I-70, which uh, crosses through the Eisenhower Tunnel, US-6 goes even higher over the Continental Divide at the Loveland Pass. This road is used mainly by trucks carrying hazardous materials, which are prohibited from using the tunnel, and also cyclists, hikers, or people like us who want to enjoy the scenery. Remember that beer I had back at uh, Glenwood Springs? Big mistake. As we climb above 11,000 feet, or almost uh, 3,400 meters, I start feeling the symptoms of a mild altitude sickness. You know, I start feeling lightheaded, short of breath, with nowhere to pull over, by the way. Wish me luck.
Eventually we find a place to pull out and I drink copious amounts of water and start feeling better. We finally make it to the top. We are here at the Continental Divide with a little bit of altitude sickness. 11,990 feet above sea level. It's kind of cold. Yep, it's pretty cold up here at 11,990 feet or 3,655 meters above sea level. The feeling perhaps intensified by my mild altitude sickness. I'm feeling better though. Down and down we go. I'm actually kind of cool with the fact that I got altitude sickness. I was always kind of intrigued, curious by it and wanted to know how it felt like. Not the best idea while driving, but at least now I know. We rejoin I-70 and continue heading east, but we are not quite going to Denver yet. We have until tomorrow morning to return the RV, so let's spend the night in the mountains, shall we? By Idaho Springs, we take State Route 103 up to Echo Lake, which is about halfway up to Mount Evans, which is the highest paved uh, road in the USA. And uh, here we are, Echo Lake. Pretty, isn't it? To the right, uh, we see the lodge, and uh, we arrive to our primitive campground. I really wanted to go all the way up to Mount Evans tomorrow, but that will be impossible with the big motorhome. We will go back to Denver tomorrow, explore the city a little, and then come back with a smaller vehicle. Take a look at this beautiful sunset. We make uh, some fire and uh, call it a night. Well, hello everybody and greetings from Denver, Colorado. This is our view from our hotel, the Hilton Garden Inn, which is conveniently located in a shopping mall. Let's explore a little bit of Colorado's capital city, where it seems like everybody is either jogging or cycling. Very healthy people. You are looking at Smith Lake in Washington Park, which is over 100 years old and one of the largest parks in the Mile High City. Its design was partially influenced by the famous philanthropist and Titanic survivor the unsinkable Molly Brown. The snow-capped uh, Rockies are, as always, ever-present throughout the city, this place being no exception, of course. We continue towards Capitol Hill, and we park right here next to the Colorado Supreme Court. And here it is, 
the Colorado State Capitol Building. Its gold-plated dome was added in 1908 to commemorate the gold rush. There is some kind of demonstration in front, some folks advocating for father's rights or something like that. And there is this statue depicting a Civil War Union soldier. In the steps of the Capitol building, and as you can see, we are exactly one mile above sea level. The building was constructed from white Colorado granite. There's uh, the city and county buildings across the Civic Center Park. Here we have a replica of the Liberty Bell. The original is in Philadelphia, of course. And we walk back towards the car passing by the Supreme Court in order to see the unique architecture of Denver's Art Museum, especially uh, the new Frederick C. Hamilton Wing. The whole complex is uh, quite nice, actually, with a bunch of street art and uh, nice cafes under pretty buildings and uh, the Guardian of Forever. No, wait, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's just another piece of uh, contemporary street art. It's all very nice, uh, very agreeable, but we must go on. There's a lot more stuff to see. Passing by the Supreme Court, once again, we go east on 14th Street, the Capitol building to our left. And to our right, we see the first home of the Colorado State Museum and the first uh, Baptist Church of Denver. Its congregation dates back to 1864, before Colorado was even a state. And we are going to turn right on Pennsylvania Street, right here, and to our left there's the St. Mary's Academy building, which now houses the Salvation Army. And behind those trees, that's the house of the notorious unsinkable Molly Brown. By the corner, she used to park her electric car. Yes, you heard right, electric, over 100 years ago. Take that, Tesla. We continue driving south along the, this very nice, albeit narrow, tree-covered street. Pennsylvania Street. This mansion in the corner is rumored to be haunted. Hmm. We are approaching the downtown area from the east now, and we are going to spend a good part of the day here. And we make a wrong turn actually and end up by Capitol Hill once again. We are actually trying to reach an area called Lodo, or Lower Downtown. And here we are, at Larimer Square, which is a trendy street block with many shops and restaurants. Let's try to find parking. Many of these buildings date back to the 1800s. General William Lorimer named this site Denver City after Kansas Governor James Denver, hoping that the city would become part of the Kansas Territory. No such luck. Nowadays, many of these historic buildings have been converted into condominiums and restaurants and such. After the Great Fire of 1863, which pretty much burned the city to the ground, wood was prohibited in building construction. That's why we have all this red brick all over the place. All these buildings along Winecup Street uh, used to be warehouses, and these were the elevated loading docks. Coming up next, we see the famous Union Station, which dates back to the 1880s. We continue walking along all these uh, former warehouses. And this is the Ice House, for example, the former creamery and the cold food storage warehouse. And now it's a condominium, of course. Eventually, Wankup Street uh, turns into this uh, pedestrian plaza, uh, right here in front of Coors Field, which is the baseball stadium home of the Colorado Rockies. And now we're walking on Blake Street, uh, which has many sports bars. Of course, there, there's no action this time of the day, so let's uh, continue exploring, walking towards the 16th Street Mall. This is the most pedestrian-friendly area in downtown Denver, uh, full of restaurants, uh, shops and hotels. This tall structure is the D&F Tower. In 1910, it was the tallest building west of the Mississippi.
Uh, the 2014 World Cup is going on, so they are broadcasting some of the games right here at Skyline Park, uh, behind the tower. Uh, lots, lots of family fun. Very nice. At the end of the park, they have this uh, funky-looking, geometrically shaped fountain uh, from the 1970s. The bottom floor of the tower nowadays uh, hosts uh, Lanny's Cabaret. And also street musicians as well. They are everywhere. Let's uh, take a quick detour uh, towards the Denver Center for Performing Arts and the Convention Center. This uh, tall building is the Curtis Hotel. Here's also the Quest Corporation building, a bell operating company, formerly the Mountain States Telephone and Telegraph Company. You'll see all these people in costume, because uh, this weekend the Colorado Convention Center is holding the Denver Comic Con, which, in case you don't know, it's a fan convention about comic books, video games, science fiction and many other genres. Fans get into costume to share in the spirit of the convention depicting their favorite characters. Very cool. We've heard that this year the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation is holding a panel here. Too bad, the event is sold out. This uh, big blue bear sculpture is Denver's most popular and most recognized piece of public art, although its official name is, uh, I see what you mean, everybody calls it the big blue bear, naturally. <laughs> Yeah, this Comic Con looks like a lot of fun. Maybe we'll plan ahead next time so we can attend. That dude needs tickets and so do we. Moving right along. Let's go back to the 16th Street Mall, among all these people in costume. This 1930s Art Deco building is the Paramount Theatre. And I feel compelled to join the Denver Street Musicians by playing this salsa tumbao on one of these uh, colorful pianos which are along the street and anybody can play them. The only vehicular traffic on the mall is uh, this shuttle bus, which is very convenient and we are gonna take it <laughs> back to the Larimer Square where we are parked. And back by Larimer Square we are, with all its historic architecture. Our curiosity, it takes us into this French quaint little market right next to the Vistro Bandon, which is a French restaurant. This bell is the only existing relic of Denver's old city hall, built on this site in 1883. We continue driving around Denver on this beautiful day, and all of a sudden, the weather begins to deteriorate. One lesson we've learned is to take advantage of the mornings here in Denver, because in the afternoon the weather can change suddenly for the worst, especially near the mountains. We are on our way towards the Red Rocks Amphitheater, which is a unique concert venue with supposedly superb acoustics. I was actually even pondering the idea of going to a concert here tonight, but we have decided against it. Let's just uh, check out the place, if the weather cooperates, of course. No such luck though, the rain is relentless. Regardless, since there is a concert happening in a couple of hours, we are not going to be allowed to go inside and check out the venue. 
By the way, all these rock formations around the stage are responsible for the unique acoustics, which make the Red Rocks Amphitheater so famous. Let's get out of here. We will come back again, if and when the weather is more appropriate. We decided to continue towards uh, Golden, Colorado, home of course beer. And lo and behold, the weather starts picking up. And we have arrived, turning here into Washington Avenue, which seems to be the main drag. We are getting kinda hungry, so let's find something to eat. And this place looks nice enough. There are plenty of restaurants along these streets, and one thing I have noticed is the abundance of good craft beer everywhere. Why would you ever have a Coors beer in this town? Maybe because Coors was founded here in 1873 by German-American brewer Adolf Coors. Yeah, they even have a statue of the guy. They also have a sculpture of a buffalo. You know, I'm really starting to like this place. Speaking of buffaloes, let's take this road up to Lookout Mountain, where they have the Buffalo Bill Memorial. Yeah, this guy, uh, William Frederick Cody, also known as Buffalo Bill, was one of the most colorful figures of the American Old West. By the way, we get some commanding views of Golden from the side of the road right here, and we also see Denver in the distance. At age 14, Buffalo Bill became a rider for the Pony Express, and later he served during the Civil War and the Indian Wars. In 1883, he founded the Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which was like a circus kind of attraction, and they traveled throughout the United States and even Europe. In 1917, he was buried at the place of his choice, right here at Lookout Mountain. They have a small museum and visitor center. After a short hike up the hill, we encounter the Masonic Tomb, the final resting place of the great Buffalo Bill. The views are grand in every direction. That is downtown Denver, far away in the distance. They also have a delicious fudge shop. Delicious. Okay, let's go back down. We make one last stop along the way to see one more time this view of Golden, Colorado and Denver. continue going around all these uh, hairpin turns. Since the weather is uh, decent now, we are going to explore one last part of the city. We have heard great things about uh, the Highland neighborhood. Just west of Lodo, across the Platte River, it is supposed to be one of the trendier areas nowadays. Let's park and explore a little bit on foot. We stumble upon Confluence Park. Actually, well, we didn't stumble upon it. We actually wanted to come here. The park marks the area where gold was discovered in 1858, and this discovery led to the founding of Denver. So you could say that this is the actual birthplace of the city, if you will. At this spot, Cherry Creek joins the Platte River, hence the name Confluence Park. Even though there are signs everywhere warning about the contamination and the pollution and dangerous chemicals, some people just don't seem to care and they dip their feet in the putrid waters. Mm. And that's all folks, that's all the time we have at the Mile High City, a city which, by the way, we have liked a lot. It is perhaps uh, the dry weather, or the mountains, or the healthy people, the progressive attitude, 
the lack of oxygen, I don't know, it is a place we would return to for sure. And why not? Perhaps spend some more time in the future. We are driving back to our hotel. Tomorrow we are going to make a day trip around the Rocky Mountains west of Denver, mainly to Mount Evans, which is the highest paved road in the United States, and the fact that marijuana is legal here actually has nothing to do with it. Highest. Get it? Good morning, once again from Denver. Today we are driving west into the Rocky Mountains. It is our intention to drive up, higher and higher, as high as one can safely drive in the United States. We get off Interstate 70 by Idaho Springs, where we begin the ascent to Mount Evans. First we take uh, State Route 103 up to Echo Lake. We are having breakfast uh, right here at the lodge, right next to this bird feeder with this view of the mountains. Since I suffered from altitude sickness a couple of days ago at the Loveland Pass, I get this oxygen canister, just in case. There is a $10 fee to use this road to go up to Mount Evans and the sign says 24 degrees Fahrenheit at the summit. Ooh. This is the highest paved road in the United States, going up to a staggering 14,130 feet above sea level. And the summit is about 100 feet higher. As we gain altitude, we start seeing less and less trees and patches of snow here and there. We are now above the tree line, tundra climate, and there are no guardrails. Any distraction could be fatal here, as the car could plunge hundreds of feet down the side of the mountain. It is 40 miles from the checkpoint to the top, but we are going to make a quick stop about 9 miles up at Summit Lake. Here we get our first views of Mount Evans, yes, it is that tall mountain to the left, now to the front of us. Here the road gets a little rougher as we arrive at Summit Lake, where we're going to take a quick break from the White Knuckle Drive. The lake is still frozen in mid-June. We continue going up, relentlessly into the thin air, now at around 13,000 feet above sea level, about 4,000 meters. At some point, I have to stop. I mean, look at this view. My goodness. And we continue going up. We are almost at the top. And here we are. These ruins belong to the Mount Evans Crest House, which had a restaurant and a gift shop, but burned down in 1979, so 
there it is. Now we'll attempt to climb to the summit of uh, Mount Evans. Let me tell you, it is not the easiest of hikes and I am freezing, by the way. <laughs> Definitely came underdressed. That structure down there uh, next to the Crest House is the Mayor Wombul Observatory. At one point it was uh, the world's highest optical observatory, now it's just the third highest. Still pretty good though. There's a lot of very slippery ice, so I must be careful. At one point after uh, slipping and falling I almost chickened out and turned around but eventually made it. Here is a 360 degree view from the top, my hand is shaky because of the cold and high winds. The best reward for the climbing effort is this view from the top of the Rockies, 14,271 feet, about 4,350 meters above sea level. By the way, I did use the oxygen spray a couple of times on the way up, <laughs> very useful. Summit. All right. Now, gotta go all the way down there. This primitive trail. It's wonderful. Well, mission accomplished. On the way down, I lose the trail a couple of times, but eventually I find it. Uh, Everest is next. I was just up there a few minutes ago. You can see Denver in the distance. Right here at Mount Evans. Elevation of 4,130 feet. Going down now. Down and down we go when I feel like stopping at every single viewpoint. Ooh, the herping turns. Let's stop here for a minute. Uh, check it out. I mean, I'm in awe looking at this view. again by Summit Lake, not stopping this time. Here we stop again for a moment to see this great view of Echo Lake. And we are once again below the timberline. We pass by Echo Lake one more time. Eventually we make it down to Idaho Springs and the junction with I-70. 
Idaho Springs was founded in 1859, during the early days of the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. This is a very touristy downtown area. Next, we are going to visit the Phoenix Mine. The way to the mine is through this uh, dirt road. They have an area along uh, this creek where visitors can try their luck at gold panning, a time-honored uh, tradition, uh, while they wait uh, or after the tour. And they have some of these uh, artifacts uh, from the good old mining days. These uh, tiny rodents are running all over the place, uh, very friendly folks not afraid at all of humans. The mine is owned by the oldest continuous gold mining family in Colorado. And the tour is uh, very nice, actually. And the guide, a very charismatic and friendly guy. It is a great tour, especially for the children, for the kids. He goes out of the way to get them interested. Uh, watch out. <laughs> they were all midgets back in the day. Malnutrition keeps you under five foot seven. This old drill right here is called a Widowmaker drill. It was invented back in 1878. This is called a lucky bucket right here. Always brought up more gold in the other bucket, so they call it lucky bucket. Since then we put it in here, people are rubbing this thing from all over the world for luck. Ooh, now do you folks see that ugly gray stuff in the rocks? The dull ugly gray is silver. The little sparkles are pyrite crystals. The brown above your head is sand and mud, no good. It turns a weird green color, buddy. But our green stuff's got gold in it, and you can touch this stuff. Go up there and look at the pretty yellow stuff in the rocks. Come here. That's all gold in the rocks. All this gold vein on any tour anywhere in the world, we checked. Now, we used to let you touch it right here. Do you see the vein of gold in there, buddy? Is that yellow in the rock? If you go up to the creek and you find a rock as big as a golf ball with that sticking out of the side, that's worth between six and ten thousand. Any kind of rock from uranium on down that's got little bits of gold in it, they call it gold ore. There's lots of rocks with gold in it. We chuck it all inside the drum and turn the machine on here. This machine makes that drum go round and round. All those steel balls in there. I bring that sand with the gold in it down here and we throw it in a little box over there in the corner. The box has little holes in the bottom, lets the sand drip out real slow when you put a water hose in there with it. Next, we stir up that machine in the corner, which grabs the leg of the table, and the whole table starts shaking when you turn the machine on. That's what I call it shaker table, it really shakes. The shaking helps the sand and the mud move across the table, buddy, because the table leans downhill that way, and downhill this way, just a little bit past the thing here. The sand comes out of the bottom of the box and vibrates across those ribs down there, heading downhill. Gold, silver, copper, all that good stuff we got in here is really heavy. It's so heavy it gets stuck behind the ribs. Then the heavy stuff follows the ribs all the way down here and falls on a concentrate bucket. And that's it in a nutshell. I think it was a time and money very well spent. Moving right along, let's uh, take this newly opened expressway to Central City, called the Central City Parkway. Central City, along with a neighboring Black Hawk, it was originally a gold rush town. In the 1990s, casino gambling was introduced, and even though Central City built the nice expressway, Black Hawk is still more popular. You know why? They have more casinos. The whole place is kind of depressing, like most gambling towns, in, in my opinion, anyways. I was hoping to find a more authentic uh, frontier town, but it is what it is. A little bit to the east, and without really noticing, we are now in Black Hawk. Uh, same thing, casinos and more casinos. They even have shuttle buses. Our next and last destination today is Boulder, Colorado, a college town. To get there, we are taking the Clear Creek Canyon Road.
to the left, we see these mountains called the Flat Irons, very famous. Boulder is home to the University of Colorado Boulder, which we can see right here, to our right. We are going to have a late lunch, or perhaps early dinner, by this nice pedestrian area called the Pearl Street Mall. Very lively with all the street musicians and performers. Well, all good things come to an end, and our time here is up. We do have a plane to catch. I hope you have enjoyed our unforgettable adventure along the Four Corners region, also known as the Wild West, and also Denver and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, do remember to subscribe, and if you liked it, give me a thumbs up and share with your friends and comment below. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, uh, so follow me there too if you will, and visit the blog at roadnomad.com. As always, thank you so much for watching, and see you on the road. I'm riding, riding with my RV. Wherever I want to be Cause I'm free in my RV Yeah, I'm riding Riding, riding Riding with my RV My RV Wherever I want to be Cause I'm free in my RV Yeah I'm free in my